Charlotte Thompson Iserby served as the head of policy at the Department of Education during the first administration of Ronald Reagan. While working there, she discovered a long-term strategic plan by the Tax-Free Foundations to transform America from a nation of rugged individualists and problem solvers to a country of servile brainwashed minions who simply regurgitate whatever they're told. We now present to you the secret history of Western education, the scientific destruction of minds. The minutes reveal that in 1910, the Carnegie trustees asked themselves this question, colon, quote, is there any way known to man more effective than war? to so alter the life of an entire people. For a year, the trustees sought an effective, peaceful method to alter the life of an entire people. But ultimately, they concluded that war was the most effective way to change people. Oh, God. World War I, horrible war. Oh, I mean, it made every other war look like nothing. They sent a confidential message to President Wilson insisting that the war not be ended too quickly. After the war, the Carnegie Endowment trustees reasoned that if they could get control, here we go, of education in the United States, they would be able to prevent a return to the way of life as it had been prior to the war. And they recruited the Rockefeller Foundation to assist in such a monumental task. Education should aim at destroying free will so that pupils are thus schooled. They will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. Influences of the home are obstructive. And in order to condition students, verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. It is for a future scientist to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black. When the technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen." End quote. Young people cannot be trusted to form their own opinion. It's our job to tell them. I had never intended to become involved in the, the battle that all of us were involved in. Uh, I had no idea anything was wrong uh, with the way the country was going when I, uh, as I was growing up, uh, and uh, even uh, during my foreign service experience, uh, I found myself mysteriously, I would say the good Lord works in wondrous ways, being put in spots around the world or in my country where extraordinary things were taking place under the guise of change. And we've all heard that so much, you know, from the Obama administration, the Bill Clinton, he was the first one to mention change agents, etc. So for some reason I, I was plucked out and uh, I found myself being sort of pushed. My name is Charlotte uh, Thompson, Isserby. my maiden name is Thompson. Uh, my husband, who I want to give great credit to at this point, uh, was Belgian from the Flemish part of Belgium. I met him, I'll explain that later, in Europe when I was working at the embassy in Brussels. Without my husband's uh, help throughout the last 30 years, certainly when we came back to Maine, uh, my work never would have happened. And uh, he understood beautifully. He had been highly educated in Europe and he understood the whole plan. In fact, about 
five years after we had come back to the United States, uh, someone gave me Gary Allen's book, None Dare Call a Conspiracy. I was on the school board and uh, this lady called me and she loved the work I was doing on the school board, of course nobody else did, but she said, I've got a book for you. She brought it down and I read it and I looked at it and I thought, I had never heard of such a thing as this. I mean, this is a conspiracy to really take over the world. Thank you, Gary Allen, who's no longer with us. And so I said to my husband, good Belgian, well-educated, uh, do you know about this? <laughs> and so he took a look at it. He said, yeah, sure, I know about it. I said, you know about this? You know about the Illuminati and the Bavarian conspiracy? You know about all, all this, the plan to implement a world order? And, 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 uh, you, huh? and he said, well, yeah, I learned all that in school. And I thought, oh. Okay, so thank you, Jan, wherever you are. I think that maybe you're very involved in helping all of us right now straighten out this mess. We go back. I was born in 1930. Yes, I'm getting there. Hmm? My mother was from uh, Virginia, a wonderful Southern conservative, wonderful gal. And my father uh, came from Pennsylvania. He came from a family that uh, in, in mining. And his father was a very recognized uh, mining engineer. Uh, who ultimately went out to South Africa and uh, opened the gold mines. And my, and my grandfather knew all these people. My grandfather was Skull and Bones. My father uh, was uh, a wonderful person. He was mayor of several towns on Long Island, New York, and in New Jersey, and he was a real constitutionalist. And somehow he was still, he was a member of Skull and Bones, but he didn't have anything to, to do with the the power structure there, right? He, he absolutely nothing. Although he did go to their meetings and he went out to the island for retreats and more that that stuff. He went to Bohemian Grove once, and uh, so I grew up in sort of an atmosphere of uh, it was a political in a way, except for local local politics, which my father was fabulous on. Anytime anybody did anything like wanted to break down local government or get rid of elected officials like regionalism does, my father would be right there with the constitution. So well, anyway, I went to private schools and uh, I got out of uh, uh, prep school in, in uh, Wellesley and I decided I really didn't want to go to college. A lot of people thought it was a mistake. I wanted to go to business school instead. I was tired of what I was, somehow I had a bad feeling about things that were being pushed in the prep school, like I, I was a member of World Federalists. I was falling for this junk, so, but somehow I didn't want to continue that. So. Instead of going on to Smith or Vassar or what, I went to Catherine Gibbs uh, Business School in New York City. Wonderful, wonderful, difficult, difficult school. But I learned best, best grammar, how to write, accounting, shorthand, which came in very, very handy, I can assure you, especially when I was in the Department of Education. I got out, I graduated, and uh, the Korean War was on. So. I, I was very patriotic. My mother had always worked for the Red Cross. She was a volunteer during World War II at the mental hospitals, bringing the guys in from the war. So I, I heard a lot about the Red Cross, which is, I want to point out right now, changed enormously from that time. And uh, I wish I could say in a better way. I think it does very good work, but it's connected with all the other, you know, uh, non-governmental, uh, non-profit groups, and they have all been infiltrated. I signed up for Korea, that's right, but they changed my orders. And at the last minute, I went to Guam. I spent a, a year there. My next assignment was Shitosi Hokkaido, another air base, fighter base, I think. I finished my tour. I didn't want to come home uh, by air. I wanted to uh, go by ship. So I decided to go. A friend of mine went with me, third class, in the bowels of uh, the Vietnam, which was a uh, freighter. Luckily, I was in third class, so I was down, and we had very good food, because French have good food, whether it's third class or not. Always a big bottle of wine in the middle of the table, and I, the people at the table were uh, coming out of North Vietnam, coming out of North Korea, and China. They were refugees, and of course, the Vietnamese ones spoke French, and the Chinese were very well-educated. They were well-educated well Chinese, so they spoke English. I spoke French. So the conversations were unbelievable. They would tell me what had happened, why they were coming out, what was going on under the communists, which uh, we didn't let General MacArthur, you know, move in and, and take over. We, 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 Truman brought him home. We could have won that war. We could have kept the whole Far East from collapsing, but that wasn't the plan. 
that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. This one woman was taking her daughter to Paris, to the conservatory there of music, uh, to study piano. And she told me that her father, or grandfather, I'm not sure, was a very famous pianist in China during the Cultural Revolution, and that they cut his hands off. And so that, I never forgot that. And then the other lady, uh, she was from Vietnam, North Vietnam, and she told me that her grandfather, they, they uh, killed him because he was opposed to the communist regime, and they cut his head off and they stuck it on a pole, and they marched around town with his head on the pole, which of course was to you know, warn the rest of the Vietnamese, keep your mouth shut, don't go up against this regime. Then uh, my father, uh, <laughs> he's a New York lawyer, he's an absolutely wonderful person, great sense of humor, and I know he's skull and bone, so we have to forgive him for that. But anyway, so he says to me after, I've been gone for two years, mind you, this is his young daughter that he cried when I left, right? What are you doing going abroad? So after two months home, he said to me, Char, well, um, when are you thinking about moving on? And I thought, God, I've only been home two months. You know, I've been gone for over two years and they want me out of here. And I thought, well, you know, I guess he's right. You know, I better not hang around home forever. And so I went down to the State Department. I had all the background because of Catherine Gibbs. That's the best thing that ever happened. I had the credentials to get into the State Department to work for ambassadors, which I did, assistant secretaries. I worked in Washington in Soviet affairs, in Middle Eastern affairs when all the Suez Canal stuff and everything was going on. I took dictation from John Foster Dulles. I'll never forget once when he was... Uh, this was really during the tremendous problems in, with the Suez Canal and everything, and he had uh, Golda Meir and the ambassador from Israel, you know, to the United States there. This is so funny because uh, I was taking shorthand, and so all of a sudden someone kicks me under the table. Golda Meir, uh, kicking, she's kicking her, her friend, the ambassador of the United States, whose name I can't recall right now, and, and uh, kicked me instead. And uh, I said, oh, gee. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, uh, uh, he's, he's dictating too, too fast. She's a, he's a very good friend of her. He's dictating too fast. There's no way you can get it. So anyway, those are little funny stories about the State Department. But anyway, and then I was in Soviet affairs. I saw very strange things there. I went to South Africa. I worked under, for the ambassador in South Africa. Fascinating because my father and my grandfather actually had lived in South Africa. Then I got sick and I came back to the States and then they assigned me to work for uh, Ambassador Douglas MacArthur Jr. That's the nephew of the general and in Brussels. He was a wonderful man. He was not easy to work for, but he was a wonderful person, a good American. And that was at the time, again, you see where, where these things kept happening in my life. This was uh, the Belgian Congo crisis and in Katanga. And I was there, I saw all the cables coming in regarding the UN troops and how they were raping uh, citizens and nuns and people were dying and all. So I was there in Brussels, here I'm learning, Charlotte's learning, that the UN isn't what people think it is. And uh, I, all these cables coming in, I meet my husband. I meet him on a train going skiing. That's how I met my husband. My husband and I are engaged. We're, we we subsequently get married in the United States. He comes over. Then we go back to Belgium and we're there for about four years. And then from there we go again to a hot spot, which I didn't realize. I'm talking about the weird things that happened. Uh, the hot spot was Grenada. I could see then from our house overlooking the bay, you know, the lagoon in St. George's, all this activity. Uh, boats coming in with strange flags. Stokely Carmichael came down there to sort of stir up the pot to get the Grenadians, uh, you know, mad at the, cap the rich, nasty capitalists who owned these yachts and all. It was really getting bad there. And I knew the political situation well because we had Grenadians working on the boat. I had a lot of Grenadian friends in government as well. Anyway, we left. Uh, we, were at, we were there about five years. And then when we left, I remember telling our Grenadian friends, you're going to have trouble here. There's troubles coming. And of course it did in 1980. 
four, I guess. That was one good thing Ronald Reagan did, which I was opposed to because it was a UN move, but he saved a lot of my friends from being killed by the, the Soviet regime in Grenada by moving in there uh, to protect so-called protect American students. Uh, but it was really the oil pipelines, I think, of Rockefeller that we were protecting. We're in Grenada. Uh, we go back to the United States. I put the children in public school. So here we go. I had no idea that uh, education would be uh, any different from sort of what I'd had. I had had a good education, a private school education, but I didn't know. And so they go into the, the public school system in Camden, Maine. And in retrospect, I believe that that was a pilot school, one of them for the whole country, for changing our education system from an academic classical educational system to uh, brainwashing for uh, the international socialist government. Uh, we, everybody has all the research on this. I have so much. It's all in my book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. I hit Camden and I start asking, you know, I get on a little committee, uh, philosophy committee, and we're all asked by the superintendent, highly skilled change agent out of Harvard, uh, well, I want to know what all of you feel the purpose of education should be. You know, and so I, I said, well, I think it should be uh, to give the, the students a, uh, a sound uh, academic education in, in uh, basics and, uh, and also a strong sense of sound morals and values. And boom, they all looked at me and they said, whose values? And I thought, hey, what's going on here? I said, well, what's happened in my country? I mean, don't we still have the same values? I mean, uh, what, don't we all sort of agree? You don't steal, you don't rob, you don't, you don't kill babies, uh, you don't kill people in war, you don't, you know, you know, a lot of things that I thought we, we believed in. You don't lie. Everything was changing, and I saw it, and I saw the curriculum coming in, and I went for the, the values clarification training myself to find out. I had a call from a master teacher who taught all over the world, and she said, you are absolutely correct. I, I was on the school board by that time. After three tries, I got on. And she said, you're absolutely correct. I want to pay for you to go for some in-service training. And I said, in what? And she said, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not, it's called Innovations in Education, and it's how to become a change agent. She paid $100 for me to go. I went. And all these normal looking people, nice, some from my own school district and all. And, and the guy is a, a facilitator, but he's using this big book called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. And it has all these case studies of teachers and administrators and how to sneak in controversial curriculum, such as death ed, sex ed, bullying ed, uh, alcohol ed, drug ed, you know, all these programs that have education hanging off the end of them, they have nothing to do with education. It's interesting. You don't have math ed and science ed and all. They call it math and science and history, right? But when you see anything with education hanging off the end of it, red flag, huh? In that training, uh, he taught us how to identify resistors in our community and they were the people who were smart, who knew that these programs were designed for nothing other than to make children engage in sex, to drink, to take drugs, to do all the things that the programs, the parents were being told the programs were to help the children. I was considered a resistor too. Here, I, here they were training, training me to identify myself. Huh? And so I never ever got over that. Also, we were being trained to go to the important people in the community, and they're really very good people. We all know who they, they are. They're friends of ours and all, but they're head of Rotary, head of Garden Club, head of Historical Society. You go to them, and you explain to them in very, very good, you know, uh, highly skilled change agent uh, manner, which is just lies, how important these programs are for your children. We've got to put these programs in. This was 1973, all the way through right now. Huh? That period in education, we call it the unfreezing of our children's values, the ones taught by the parents at home and, and the church, basically. Change agents were highly trained 
by the National Training Laboratories. We had the headquarters for that in Bethel, Maine. That goes all the way back to World War II. I have the original paper from that, and it said that what they're putting in is the, they want to change the values to unfreeze the system, and then they're going to implement the new values, the new communist values for world government, huh? So that was the goal, uh, and they did a good job on it between 1970 and the year 2000. And now the values, as we can all see, People are saying, oh, well, we've got to be tolerant, you know, there are no, no absolutes anymore. That's not fair to, to judge people. Don't be judgmental. If your, your grandmother is dying of cancer and can't afford, uh, you can't afford the medicine, uh, it's okay to steal it. You know, that's what you call uh, values clarification uh, with the uh, education for a planned economy using uh, workforce training, uh, to identifying children at a very early age, what they're going to do the rest of their lives. It's the Soviet uh, planned economic system, starting as early as first grade. Uh, that's being put in now uh, under the guise of school choice, charter schools, and using the uh, performance-based, outcome-based, uh, Skinnerian Pavlovian method with a computer. Pavlov, interestingly enough, was uh, a Russian. People think that he invented uh, operant conditioning. He didn't. He went to Leipzig, Germany, and uh, he studied under Wilhelm Wundt in the 1800s, mid-1800s. Wilhelm Wundt was a philosopher, German philosopher, who uh, was involved in trying to figure out how you can get people to do change, you know, understanding the uh, psychology, what makes people click, uh, how you can get them to do what you want them to do, etc. And he became very frustrated with uh, the inability to change people's behavior and their views and everything, uh, doing the traditional way, you know, lectures and this and that and all, and discussions and all. And finally, he realized that what he was dealing with was the human soul. The soul is a very difficult thing to track. It sort of floats all over the place and it rebels and it doesn't, you know, it, it's independent. And so he came up with a scheme to uh, attack the, the nervous system. That's really what it is. It's neurological. If you can get them to react in certain ways to what you want, like, like when the doctor, give you a good idea, the doctor used to, physical exams, they, they take a hammer, a little rubber thing, and knock your knee and it goes boop. So he figured, well, you know what? We, we can operate on that thesis where we, we attack the, uh, the nervous system. And it's a stimulus response thing. So you have to provide the stimulus in order to get the response. Well, if it was dog training, the stimulus would be a dog biscuit or something. And ultimately, you know, when the dog sees you pull, taking the biscuit out of the, the box, uh, he's going to do what you want, right? And uh, so it's really, really pretty simple. I had, I had never gotten involved in having to figure it out until, uh, until uh, a very good friend of mine, a teacher in Arizona, had to go through the first program that was brought out of 19, 1965. One of the first ones it was called Mastery Learning. And she quit education when she went through the training. She said it was so sick. And she had, she had do papers from doctors and all saying it, made the ch it even makes children sick. And she, I met her when I went into the U.S. Department of Ed because I found her correspondence came to my office and it was referred to me. And that was how I met her. And she was the one who educated me about upward conditioning and, and how, how awful it is. I mean, it can absolutely destroy free will. We had free will until we got to the computer. The computer absolutely uh, destroys. The child cannot, is, there's no thinking going on there. There's no transfer being made. And you've got to understand that. All the documents in regard to this by, by people, not myself, by educators who have been trained in it, are in my book. So you don't have to say Charlotte said that. You know, you can say Professor so-and-so said that. Uh, I, I have one incredible paper in the back of my book by a, a leading educator written in the 60s that I managed to get. It was attached to the Project Best application for funding hmm? that I talked about, the one I got fired for. And that paper talks about the need for computers and how wonderful they're going to be and all. But he says, if you don't agree with a message morally and ethically that's going on to that software, do not do it. And that's coming right out of the mouth of an educator involved in it. 
He says, you have to have a conscience because that software is so powerful that no matter, you may think, oh, well, the person on the other end, you know, he can do what he wants and make up. No, once it's in the software and once the child is clicking away on the computer and getting a little happy face as the reward, hmm? that's what happens. We all know that feeling when we get something good on the computer. He's not going to ask any questions. That's it. Finished. And it can bring the student to a certain totally opposite position in their thinking using Socratic questioning. So it's very dangerous. I can't tell you how dangerous it is. I mean, how dangerous is a method that can actually change, ab actually destroy one's conscience? That's bad news. And we were all softened up, and that's what we're looking at today. Now, the refreezing has to take place. The refreezing is going to take place with the use of the computer. Schools will be bookless. Uh, they are already some, uh, some of these programs coming in. So anyway, I, I was on the board. I saw that. I went for the retraining. Then I, I get, got off the board, and, and I formed with Bettina Dobbs of Maine, a wonderful teacher and a nurse. I formed, we formed something called Guardians of Education for Maine. And uh, we were in business for about 15 years. We did a lot of very good work. In uh, 1980, I went to work for Ronald Reagan, uh, and I worked there for two years until I was fired. Right. But uh, I had worked hard for him from 1978 to get him elected. Right. And then in 1980, because of the work I'd done uh, and the work in education, they put me I got an appointment in the U.S. Department of Education because the people in Washington with the, the, the conservatives, they were good back then. They're not anymore. Uh, they were uh, very they were very impressed by the work I'd done in Maine uh, on education. So they pulled me down and put me in the U.S. Department of Ed in what was the most important slot probably in the world in education. I know people out there are shaking their head and say, why would they put her there? She doesn't have a college education, right? Why are they putting her in there? Well, they knew, uh, first of all, Reagan had promised to get rid of the Department of Education, something he didn't do, and I will hold that against him forever, because he could have. Since that was the plan, when, the, when they were staffing the department, they didn't have to put important people in those old slots, like my slot that I got put into would have been filled by the former president of Harvard or Stanford or something, right? Or University of Chicago. That job had been held in the past by very important people in education. But since they were getting rid of the department, it didn't make any difference. Hmm? So they just plopped me in. Now talk about the hand of God, huh? And all my files were full of everything they planned on doing. And so I don't even think my boss knew this. You know, he was a so-called conservative. But he became very suspicious about me because I was always busy. Uh, even though I didn't have a lot of work to do from him, I was always busy because I had lots of things to read. And I would stay after work. I'd stay until 2 a.m. in the morning when everybody was gone. I'd get into everything. Sure, if, if, if it had just been the job and all the files and everything had been, had been whisked away by these former very important educational change agent communists, Marxists, uh, I would not have found stuff, but all the stuff was left in the office. What I saw was so depressing. That's hardly the word. I mean, this was, this was the education of Charlotte. It was the greatest horror story I had ever encountered. And at one point, he sent me, he, he wanted to get rid of me out of that office. He sent me up to the National Institute of Education which is where all the research is performed. They send out all the grants and contracts to the universities or schools or whatever from there. I found out I was really in the belly of the beast right there because I, I had access to all the computer printouts of all the grants and contracts of your money folks going out, not just in, uh, across our country, but all around the world about how to change the education system from academics to a brainwashing using Pavlovian, Skinnerian, operant conditioning computers and workforce training for the globalist economy, the corporate fascist, socialist, communist government that's coming right in this minute. I had a friend from Maryland who used to come and she had a huge Cadillac. And uh, 
I'd get all my stuff and put it in, interesting for Maine people, LL bean bags. You know those big LL bean bags? Those huge ones. And I'd put all the papers in there. And at lunchtime, we'd, we'd meet uptown for lunch. She'd come in, marvelous gal, Australian, who I absolutely love, probably one of the finest Americans who ever, uh, she was Australian, but she did more for our country than anybody I've ever known. Brilliant. We'd meet, dump the stuff in her car, go have lunch. She'd take it home. She'd get some of it out to the people across the country. It's really marvelous. Well, once uh, I had these two big bags and two of these major change agents at National Institute of Education, uh, they were coming down. I was going to the elevator and they were walking down. And I thought, oh, oh no, you know, I've, I've got to get out of here. So I had to go in the men's room and hide. And uh, I'd never forget that, hiding in the men's room. And I thought, what if, I mean, there may be other guys coming in here, not just to the elevator. And, and anyway, nobody came in. They went down the elevator. I came out and dumped the stuff in her car. It was not a really um, exciting job. It was mainly to see if the universities, the schools, the different entities across the country that were getting money or around the world from the taxpayers, that they were getting their final, their quarterly reports in on time. That's all. It had nothing to do with philosophy. Huh? And so one day I ran across a grant to Lansing School District, Lansing, Michigan. This was University of Michigan connection with my office. And it was a values clarification program for first graders, elementary school. And it pre and post tested those little children about what goes on at home, what religion do you, oh, and I looked at this thing and I thought, what on earth are they doing? And so I turned to this bureaucrat who was working uh, with the GAO about financial things and I said, look, we're doing waste, fraud, and abuse. I know that. But I said, what do you, take a look at this. Don't you think that this is pretty wasteful, fraudulent, and abusive in another way? And so he took a look at it and he said, oh, my Lord. He said, this is horrible. And really nice guy, bureaucrat, Washington. And people sometimes get after all the bureaucrats. They're not all that bad. Some of them are just like us, and they're, they care. And uh, I said, well, look, uh, you know, I'm only meant to be here two weeks. But could you give me extra time? Because I want to go through all these grants and contracts. And he said, you can have as much time as you want. So I spent six weeks up there going through all the stuff. And uh, I can't tell you how horrible. First of all, even if you don't care about children, you don't care about education, you don't care about your country, you don't care about anything, people. Are there people out there who don't care about anything? They do care about their wallet, huh? You should care about this money that has been spent in the name of education. It's total brainwashing. Anything coming out of Washington is a total Marxist brainwash. And Marxism is the world of the future unless we stop it right now. I'm fired for leaking one of these documents to human events. It was the one that put technology into, with the computer on it, with the curriculum on it. Uh, it was a grant going out to every single state with uh, the computer curriculum uh, for the state, can you imagine, designed by Washington and all the different government education associations. And within that big paper that I found, Better Education Skills Through Technology, it was called Project Best, I found this one paper, one thing, this was sort of a draft, and it said, what we at the federal level can control and manipulate. That's a direct quote. Colon. And then it listed, this is for us at the local level because we don't know how to run our own laws and the state. I get fired. Uh, then uh, I write the president, I write Reagan, and I tell him what's going on in the department. And uh, I said, you would be shocked if you knew. This place has got to be shut down, etc. And it was a long letter. I explained everything that the U.S. Department of Education is a Marxist factory designed to destroy any semblance of good, good values, academics, etc., and to make sure our children march blindly into a socialist communist world government. That's the goal of the U.S. Department of Education. They didn't want, they, anyone to know that Ronald Reagan had that letter. 
So I never got a reply. I tried to. I called Ed Meese. I called. I went well, went home. Called uh, Ed Meese, who was the chief counselor or whatever in the White House, and I said, "I want to talk to you all. I want an answer to that letter." Uh, finally, I went down and talked with Ed Meese's aide, Ken Cribb, and I said, "I." He patted me on the shoulder. You know that all that way they do that. Oh, Charlotte, uh, aren't you pleased to know the president got your letter? That's an admission right there. Hmm? I know he got it because uh, John Lofton, a journalist at that time in Washington, called his office, the White House, back in 1983 or something, uh, and asked. And they said, yes, it's on his desk, and he's marked it up. So let's get that straight. He had it. The purpose of that letter was to make sure that that department is abolished and the American at public education is returned to its original status. At, run at the local level and with elected school board members and with no influence whatsoever from the federal or international level. That's how it should be. It was the best education system in the world. That's what I was asking for. Anyway, it didn't happen. That letter to Reagan, again, is on my website, Deliberate Dumbing Down, under a PDF. I wrote in 1985 a book called Back to Basics Reform or Skinnerian International Curriculum. And to make sure people read this little 39-pager, I decided to put an asterisk so that they didn't really have to read it. I put an asterisk which said, Necessary for United States participation in a one-world socialist government plan for the early years of the 21st century. When the conservatives, the neocons, let's call them that, not Goldwater people, when the neoconservatives, Heritage Foundation, all of those groups, I'm sorry folks, when they decided, when they saw that book, they boycotted it. They boycotted that book, which told Americans exactly what I just told all of you, what I'd seen, and that we had to get rid of the department. It all happened under Ronald Reagan. You call it what you want, corporate fascism, fascism, socialism, communism, Planned economy, you call it what you want. What is it? It's, it's really, uh, it's horrible. Your children have no upward mobility whatsoever. I told you earlier, I said, yeah, they're put into a slot early on. The, the government and the, and the schools, they decide what your child is capable of doing the rest of his life. He, he, he might be able to sneak out of that sometime if he's brilliant and uh, do his own thing, but it's unlikely. So it's fixed. Uh, this is the end of upward mobility for our children, end of freedom for this country. Planned economy is the end of freedom. It's a failed system, but there are people at the top who, who live very well by it. And then I find out that Ronald Reagan has signed an agreement with Gorbachev to merge the two education systems. Well, you can't tell me that conservatives didn't know that was going on, because I know some who were at Geneva when this happened. And they didn't do anything about it, but we found out. And so we fought this United States-Soviet Education Exchange Agreement. The Carnegie Corporation also signed agreements. Uh, basically, most of that was in to, to do with computers and technology and critical thinking for little elementary school children. Those agreements were signed. We paid five, we raised $5,000 to put an ad in the Washington, Post, Washington Times to expose that. It was called uh, Educate is Worse Than Watergate or something. And uh, but again, we got no support because that information wasn't meant to get out. Then, uh, about four years after the fact, I, I, uh, my little article was called Soviets in the Classroom, America's Latest Education Fad, that nobody would touch. The conservatives, the, all the different conservative groups, media and all, would not publish it. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I got a phone call from a wonderful man by the name of Robert Morris. He was a judge from New Jersey. He calls and, and he said, uh, I'm now the president of America's Future. And I had tried to get this article published by America's Future, Soviets in the Classroom. And uh, I couldn't get it published. It was interesting because America's Future used to do a lot of articles on bad textbooks and everything in the United States. And I thought surely they would be interested in the United States Soviet textbook uh, agreement too, and exchanges. And I was sure they, but no, they would not publish it. So this marvelous Bob Morris became president. He found my article in a drawer in the desk that was left there, the manuscript. And he read it and he thought, oh, what is this? Can you imagine? He's a leading conservative himself, very important person. 
He had not heard about it. He had not heard what Reagan had done. It's happened ever since 1958 when the first agreement was signed by Eisenhower with the Soviet Union at the peak of the Cold War. And then the various agreements have been signed all the way through until recently, one with terrible one with China. So we have merged and let me point out just today, I was informed that uh, there are forces at work in the state of Maine that are surrounding our wonderful people that we elected last November. Traditional Mainers, good hardworking Mainers who were very upset about what's going on. They worked hard to get our governor in, a wonderful man, Paul LePage. And I want to warn all of you that out in your states, if you elected some really good people, they've been surrounded. And you've got to be very careful. You've got to let them know not to go along with any of the agendas that call for regional government or consolidation. Because regionalism, you know, the merging of services, the police forces in one town, police force merges with another one, the schools consolidate, all the little schools merge into a big one. They tell you that's to save money and all. They're lying to you because it doesn't. We know that. It doesn't save money. But what it really is, regionalism is communism. And I have an article. It's in Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. You can look up the name Zeitlin. You will see this communist writer for the Communist Daily World in the mid-70s talking about the need for the United States to implement regionalism and consolidation. It's communism. So any effort that you see out there where they use the word, they don't use the word regionalism that much anymore, they're getting smart. They use the word consolidation. They convince the people, especially in economic down, downturn times like right now, this tragic time we're going through, that this will save money. They won't have as high taxes. Consolidate, consolidate, don't do it. We are the major country that's going down to communism and the rest of the world will follow. They'll call it the global system, the international socialist global system. It is nothing but a totalitarian system. In 2002, President Gorbachev, in speaking in London, he called the European Union the new European Soviet. We know what we're looking at. The North American Union and all other regional entities throughout the world, whether it's the Pacific Circle Consortium or whether it's the Middle East. You think we went into the Middle East for any reason other than to destroy Iraq and uh, to make it part of a region in, uh, hooked into the banks? Hmm? What they're doing is they're destroying the Middle East so they can restructure it as a region in this new world order. So these are all the regions. Their whole structure is based on the model, which is the European Union. So I ask Americans, what will you call? What would Gorbachev call the North American Union? He would call it the North American Soviet. How do we like that? Wake up. If there's anything that is important for you to remember from these videos today is that we are at the end of the line. We are doing exactly what Gorbachev wants. Consolidation. Now, this is an interesting cartoon. This is regional government. This is the consolidation of schools, basically. And you see the little guy in the one-room schoolhouse. He's chewing a piece of grass or something. And he looks very happy. He belongs to Little Frog Lick Creek High School. He's chewing the grass with a smile. If you follow him through, you're going to see him looking more and more miserable as they merge his one-room schoolhouse to a six-room schoolhouse to eight more schools and then into a central school which is a region uh, and then you're going to see him at the end he's holding his left arm out up like this clenched fist little hair very unhappy call and his t-shirt says our lady of the benevolent dictatorship one world global training corps and then the last one he has on earphones you know like you guys have all the time. Finally, he's smiling. He's connected to something with a wire. And it says, Interplanetary Carbon Unit Reprogramming Pod. Well, I saw that, 
in a very liberal left education journal called Phi Delta Kappa. Many people will recognize that, 1983. The title of it is Consolidation, going from the small school to the central regionalized school, and uh, which is what regional government is all about. And you know, you can get rid of the, all the parochial views that the children have in the little school where the parents can go you know, the school board meeting is just across the street, the school, and all the parents know each other, the teacher, you know, it's a lovely atmosphere. And then you end up with all the children going long distances on the bus, which is no good for them, to the regional school. And then you have country boys and girls who are being mixed with city boys and girls. So then they get into the drug scene. So we've seen with consolidation that the test scores go down, the drug problem gets worse. The cost of education increases, although they tell you that consolidation is to make it cheaper. A lot of people just don't understand the word consolidation. Consolidation is consolidating all the services together under the guise of this is going to be cheaper for you. But in the process, what happens is you lose all your elected officials because all of these entities are being merged. So at the local level, you don't have any representation anymore. And ultimately, you spend far more. That's the whole restructuring of our constitutional form of government, is being thrown to the wolves in favor of this regionalism and consolidation system in every area. Education, uh, you know, government bureaucracy to make things cheaper, uh, you name it. Uh, planning, the word is central planning. That's the Soviet system, central planning regionalism. No matter how beautiful everything looks outside, no matter how good those restaurants are in your town, or the good funny movies, or the whatever, no matter whatever beautiful things you see in your life, and your family, etc, etc, folks, it's curtains. October 24, 1975. The World Affairs Council uh, of Philadelphia issued a Declaration of Interdependence written by well-known historian and liberal think tank Aspen Institute board member Henry Steele Commager. This alarming document, which called to mind President Kennedy's July 4, 1962 speech calling for a Declaration of Interdependence, Kennedy, huh? was written as a contribution to our nation's celebration of its 200th birthday and signed by 125 members of the U.S. Senate and House. When in the course of history the threat of extinction confronts mankind, it is necessary for the people of the United States to declare their interdependence with the people of all nations and to embrace those principles and build those institutions which will enable mankind to survive and civilization to flourish. Two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order. We affirm that the economy of all nations is a seamless web and that no one man can any longer effectively maintain its processes of production and monetary systems without recognizing the necessity for collaborative regulation by international authorities. This little blue book is called Conclusions and Recommendations, and it has a weird title, and you'd think it only deals with social studies, but it doesn't. It's the Report of the Commission on the Social Studies. It was funded by the Carnegie Corporation, and the book virtually recommends that the curriculum all be geared towards the Soviet system, internationalism, planned economy, etc. It's been referred to by a leading British uh, professor of British socialism as a, a plan for a socialist America. This book is at my son's website, americandeception.com, thank heavens, because this is the only copy that exists in the whole world, right here. All right, so that's dated 1934. And, and what they're doing there is they're, they're really talking about putting in a planned economy. So that's what we're putting in right now with the, the program that's just going into our little school in Dresden, Maine. We've put in the De Lorenzo Reinventing Schools uh, plan, which I said earlier, uh, your, your, kids, your children will be graduating at 14 or 21. No grades, no ABCD, 
no kindergarten through 12th grade, because it's going to all be workforce training and the curriculum will be based on the Malcolm Baldrige Total Quality Management Award. It has only in the past been given to Cadillac and Hilton Hotels and things like that. The Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award gets results. We're not there yet. We're continuously improving and it's something that is so deep in our organization that the concepts and principles of Baldrige will be applied forever here. So this same Carnegie Corporation in 1933 instituted the eight-year study, which went on until 1941. That's the Skinner method, performance-based, results-based. That's all what you, what you can do, not what you know in your head. They don't want children to think or know anything, no history. No. It's what you can do for the good of the global economy. And uh, the Education Commission of the States, a very important unconstitutional regional entity, which controls education in every state as well, they had a little newsletter that I used to get. And one day I was reading it, and my eyes went down to the bottom of the page, and I said something, it said, it said outcomes-based education is, and of course I've always been fighting outcomes-based education, and it said it was experimented with for eight years in the 1930s and 40s by the Carnegie Corporation. It was called the eight-year study. So nothing's new, folks. If we think the outcomes-based education, that we, which, which is the biggest dumbing down education system that ever happened with children graduating at 14, right? Uh, if we think that it's new, no. It came from the eight-year study, which again was Carnegie, okay. Now Carnegie, we might as well mention this at the same tone. 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Carnegie was all involved in paying for the national assessment, which is all 60% politically correct. That's the test that all schools around the country have had to give for the past, ever since 1965. Now it is 60% politically correct. Your kids' ideas on uh, global warming, sustainable development, a world government, the fact that constitution's outmoded, all that. So they paid for the national assessment. They were the ones instrumental in putting up the money for the Education Commission of the States in Denver. In your Senate Education Committee, in your state, there's always going to be one person who is on the membership of the uh, Education Commission of the States. So there'd be about 50 state people. So they get their orders from the Education Commission of the States. That's Carnegie, paid for that. In 1985, Carnegie signed an agreement with the, with the Soviet Academy of Science. At the same time, Reagan signed the agreements with Gorbachev to merge the two education systems. Carnegie uh, signed with the Academy of Science to develop computer courseware for elementary schools dealing with critical thinking. That was an agreement signed. That's for our children, right? In first grade, critical thinking on the computer. Reagan, Clinton, the two Bushes and all, implement the school-to-work agenda. That was the beginning of the planned economy under Reagan. So then uh, Mark Tucker comes in, Carnegie. All the controversy going on in the 90s, Americans were up in arms about the destruction of their school systems. They would go in deliberately and destroy, because in order to restructure, you have to destroy. Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, David Hornbeck, who's big on compulsory uh, uh, community service, compulsory. He called for that when he was the superintendent of schools in, uh, in Maryland. He was the commissioner. Way back, he called for mandatory service. That's another thing, folks. You better watch out. You're gonna be, we're going to be slaves. Mandatory service. So anyway, the same Hornbeck, who's connected to Carnegie all along, goes into Kentucky, destroys that system, goes up to Rochester, New York, he goes out to the state of Washington, U Iowa, destroy the schools, restructure them for school to work. That's all Carnegie. And the latest information coming in uh, for Maine, with a complete uh, recommendation, that is, who knows, maybe our governor, well, we can get to him fast enough, you know, to help him understand what, that we can't have charter schools. Charter schools are the vehicle to implement the planned economy. We can't have them. They're unelected school boards anyway. We don't even have a school board with a charter school. They get federal money. Why no school board? They get federal money, so we have to give the federal test. No charter schools, forget it. 
So all of this is coming together, coalescing at the same time. The 3,000 page hearings of the Congressional Investigation of the Reese Committee, uh, investigation of the subversive activities of the tax exempt foundations. I bought the only available copy in the country, 3,000 pages from a really good friend of mine, a wonderful American. He had been offered any, any amount of money for that 20 years ago by one of the minions of the found tax exempt foundations. They did not want that copy to be floating around. The research director for those hearings, his name was Norman Dodd. I knew him. And uh, the conversation that I'm going to discuss right now that he had uh, with the president of the Ford Foundation, Rowan Gaither, was off the record in New York City at Ford Foundation headquarters. And Norman Dodd told me over dinner in Washington, D.C., in a restaurant in Georgetown, Rowan Gaither said to him, Mr. Dodd, uh, you know, basically, we've, we at the foundations, we don't determine the agenda. The agenda has come from directions from the White House. That was Eisenhower at the time, right at the peak of the Cold War. And that agenda, our instructions are to use our tax exempt status, your money folks, change America so it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Now, a lot of you may say, well, that never happened. Well, it's happening right now, folks. It's happening right now as we speak. Foundation funded non-bloody revolution. Committee Chairman Carol Reese warned fellow congressmen of a diabolical conspiracy that a certain few foundations were financing the socialist and communist overthrow of the United States. Uh, after World War I, they tried to get the League of Nations in. And there was tremendous opposition to that. And then you had opposition between then and between World War II. You had Lindbergh and all the, a lot of Americans going before the Congress to keep us from going into the UN. You had all sorts of opposition. But they got their way. The Reese Committee learned that the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Endowment for International Peace were, with tax-exempt dollars, funding leftist propaganda operations aimed at changing America through the brain, not the battlefield. Patriotism, national sovereignty, individual responsibility, and Christian beliefs were belittled, while the concepts of a one-world government, socialism, collectivism, and humanism were deemed essential for peace in the modern age. A clandestine and successful non-bloody revolution had been masterminded by some of America's most powerful and devious men, men who did not want to be exposed by a congressional investigating committee. The man chosen by Reese to be the committee's research director was Norman Dodd, Yale graduate, intellectual, and New York investment banker. During this writer's frequent visits to Dodd's retirement home in Keene, Virginia, he repeatedly spoke, Dodd, of his conviction that justice demanded that those foundations should be compelled to spend a like amount of dollars to undo the damage they have done to America." End quote. Dodd sent committee questionnaires to numerous foundations and as a result of one such request, Joseph E. Johnson, president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, invited Dodd to send a committee staffer to Carnegie's headquarters in New York City to examine the minutes of the meetings of the endowment's trustees. Now this is Carnegie we're talking about, the one I always go after. These minutes had long since been stored away in a warehouse and obviously Johnson, who was a close friend of former Carnegie president and Soviet spy Alger Hiss, had no idea what was in them. Don't forget Alger Hiss headed up the UN in San Francisco. He was the head of the whole thing, world government. The, the minutes reveal that in 1910, the Carnegie trustees asked themselves this question, colon, quote, is there any way known to man more effective than war to so alter the life of an entire people, end quote. This is in the minutes. For, for a year, the trustees sought an effective, peaceful method to alter the life of an entire people. But ultimately, they concluded that war was the most effective way to change people. Oh, God. World War I. Horrible war. Oh, God. I mean, it made every other war 
look like nothing. Consequently, the trustees of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace next asked themselves, quote, how do we re-involve the United States in a war? And they answered, quote, we must control the diplomatic machinery of the United States by first gaining control of the State Department. Now, don't forget, this is 1910. Norm Dodd said that the trustees' minutes reinforced what the Reese Committee had uncovered elsewhere about the Carnegie Endowment, that it had already become a powerful policy-making force inside the State Department. During those early years of the Carnegie Endowment, war clouds were already forming over Europe and the opportunity for the enactment of their plan was drawing near. History proved that World War I did indeed have an enormous impact on the American people. For the first time in our history, large numbers of wives and mothers had to leave the home to work in war factories, thus effectively eroding women's historic role as the heart of the family. The sanctity of the family itself was placed in jeopardy. Life in America was so thoroughly changed that according to Norman Dodd, quote, the trustees had the brashness to congratulate themselves on the wisdom and validity of their original decision, end quote. They sent a confidential message to President Wilson, horrible, listen to this, insisting that the war not be ended too quickly. Carnegie trustee Cleveland Dodge, one of Wilson's financial supporters, had direct access to the president, and as did Ella Hugh Root, endowment president from 1910 to 1925. After the war, the Carnegie Endowment trustees reasoned that if they could get control, here we go, of education in the United States, they would be able to prevent a return to the way of life as it had been prior to the war. And they recruited the Rockefeller Foundation to assist in such a monumental task. According to Dodd, quote, they divided the task in parts, giving to the Rockefeller Foundation the responsibility of altering education as it pertains to domestic subjects, that was the, the Southern Education Board they set up, but Carnegie retained the task of altering our education in foreign affairs and about international relations, that would be UNESCO, UN, all that stuff. The foundations decided that the most effective method of achieving this goal would be to alter American history. So they awarded grants, fellowships, and scholarships to those professors and historians who would rewrite American history and promote one-worldism, humanism, and socialism. By the early 30s, the well-laid plans of the Foundation trustees had reached fruition, and a Reese Committee staff report concluded, one, that there had indeed been a non-bloody revolution in America between 1933 and 1936, two, that a certain few foundations had funded efforts to change the beliefs of the American people through education and propaganda, and three, that these revolutionary changes had been accepted without resistance. To demonstrate how thoroughly American opinion had been changed according to the plan of the foundations, we cite the following historical example. At the end of World War I, Woodrow Wilson and his shadowy alter ego, Colonel Edward M. House, tried to sell the U.S. Senate and the American people on the idea of the League of Nations. This was, of course, the first concerted international effort towards a one-world government. Wilson and House failed in their mission, but a generation later, after another great war and much re-education via college international relations clubs, international studies, educational grants, and the like, the Senate and the people readily accepted membership in the United Nations. Roosevelt's foreign policy advisor, Alger Hiss, helped write the UN Charter in which the Soviet Union was given three votes in the General Assembly and the United States only one. And then before his perjury conviction for lying, that's his, about his Soviet espionage activities, he went on to become president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Chairman Reese expressed justifiable rage when he described what was happening as a diabolical conspiracy the conspirators had left little to chance. Those congressional investigations of the early 50s into tax-exempt foundations were mandated by the House of Representatives in a resolution stating, quote, the committee is authorized and directed to conduct a full and complete investigation to determine which of such foundations and organizations are using their resources for un-American and subversive activities for political purposes, propaganda, or attempts to influence legislation. Now, folks, I want to tell you the 3,000 pages of testimony 
risk committee hearings is at my son's website, americandeception.com. Uh, the person I bought the hearings from, the transcript, was offered 20 years ago any amount of money for that 3,000 pages. The foundations wanted it back. It was the only copy left available. And he would not sell it to them. So my friend sold it to me. My friend knew Norman Dodd very well. He sold it to me for $3,000, which is really cheap, right? A, 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 a dollar a page. Hmm? He'd been offered any amount. They said, we'll pay you anything. You name it, anything. We want that copy. So it's now on the web for everybody to read. All right, now we'll continue. The congressional investigations, right? To determine which of such foundations and organizations are using their resources for un-American and subversive activities for political purposes, propaganda, or attempts to influence legislation. The tax-exempt status granted to foundations by the Congress of the United States is a special and powerful privilege subsidized by the American taxpayer. Therefore, Congress has not only the authority, but also the obligation to investigate how tax-exempt funds are spent. This should be the next investigation. Ron Paul should do this one mm -hmm. after the Federal Reserve. The Ford Foundation, largest of all the foundations, balked when it received a preliminary questionnaire from the Reese Committee. H. Rowan Gaither, president of the multi-billion dollar foundation, summoned committee research director Dodd to foundation offices in New York City. At the meeting, Gaither asked, Mr. Dodd, we invited you to come here because we thought that perhaps off the record. You see, that's why it's not in the transcript of the hearings, what I'm reading you now. This was off the record in the office in New York City. Uh, we invited you here because we thought that perhaps off the record, you would be kind enough to tell us why the Congress is interested in the operations of foundations such as ours. Gaither answered his own rhetorical question with a startling admission. Mr. Dodd, all of us here at the policy-making level of the foundation have at one time or another served in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, or the European Economic Administration, operating under directives from the White House. We operate under those same directives. The substance of the directives under which we operate is that we shall use our grant-making power to so alter life in the United States that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union." End quote. Stunned, Dodd finally replied, quote, why don't you tell the American people what you just told me? And you could save the taxpayers thousands of dollars set aside for this investigation. Gaither responded, Mr. Dodd, we wouldn't think of doing that. In public, of course, Gaither never admitted what he had revealed in private. However, on numerous public occasions, Norman Dodd repeated what Gaither had said and was neither sued by Gaither nor challenged by the Ford Foundation. The latest article that I've written uh, with Debbie Niwa, a wonderful researcher, a magnificent person and brilliant, uh, did all the graphics and formatting and, and a lot of her own research as well on change agents and uh, how, they, how they brought Americans to have a totally different mindset using all of the sensitivity training. Oh, Debbie had some fantastic research of hers is in that article. As well as uh, at the end of writing it, we came across extraordinary uh, quotes from C.S. Lewis who, who points out that if you substitute workforce training for education that's the end of civilization it's the end of the human being as a as an entity opposed to being an animal it's the end of the human soul it's the end of the conscience and we have all of the evidence from educators and change agents articles saying that the computer is fantastic for changing values an educator with the World Institute for Computer Assisted Instruction, his name is Dustin Houston, where he talks about, won't it be wonderful when the child in the smallest school, most remote area in the country can have uh, the uh, curriculum developed by the world's finest psychologists and nobody can get between that child and the curriculum. Parents, wake up. That means you parents. You can't get between the child and that curriculum. 
you can't control anything anymore. You've lost it. This is going in right now. And they say this works too. What works? I always wondered when I saw this stuff titled What Works in the US Department of Ed and I didn't pay too much attention. And one day I picked it up, something, and what works? Yeah, dog training works. If you reinforce, if you give rewards and all. And mind you folks, the rewards are being passed out galore all over our country now, not just in education. In my former town of Bath, the police, the community-oriented policing system, the police are giving rewards to citizens who do good deeds. They give them a little medal. They see them to help an older lady down across the street who has groceries. The police determine what the good deed is. She gets a medal. That's a reward. That's conditioning. That's operant conditioning. You can end up with a society that never does anything for the sake of it being right. And they're never going to take a stand against anything unless it's approved by the government. So that is the res that's going to be the result of operant conditioning. It's throughout our, our community right now. The Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, when he was in Chicago, with the Chicago schools, he even recommended paying students for good grades. Now, that's why teachers are up in arms about merit pay, performance-based pay. That's the same thing. They're going to pay the teachers for students getting good test scores. Now, wait a minute. First of all, you might think that sounds good. No, you got to ask yourself, what's the test? It's hard to believe that anybody would deliberately do this to children, but they are. They're evil people, and their agenda has been evil ever since this book was written. This is it. Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robeson, great Scottish scholar back in 1798. He was a Scottish Freemason, and he went to France and studied you know, French Orient masonry, and was so shocked by what he saw, it was so much worse than the Scottish Rite, that he went back and wrote that book, which he actually did give a copy to George Washington. That book is like a global education textbook being used in the American schools right now. It talks about 1798, this is after the French Revolution, you know, get rid of royalty, get rid of religion, get rid of the family, that's basically what's in the book. Huh? Uh, actually, uh, they talk about dropping borders. Hmm? <laughs> Sounds just like a global ed curriculum. Uh, turning the children against their parents. Uh, it's pure communism. Uh, that's why I say that now, uh, basically the only thing that we can do, certainly with education, which is being turned into nothing but a uh, corporate uh, school to work agenda uh, using the Soviet Cuban polytech system where they pull the children out, send them over to the cigar factory, you know, at noon to learn how to make cigars. The same thing here, that's being put in. It's been in the works for 30 years. It's the nail is going in the coffin right now. It's coming out of Europe. It's, it's the program that's going through Maine right now is called Reinventing Education uh, De Lorenzo. This is all in my article, The Death of Free Will. Uh, all of this documentation about the final nail in the coffin, which will be school to work across the board uh, for corporate, global corporate profits. Our children are nothing but human resources and guinea pigs to be trained like animals. Animal training using Pavlov, Skinner, uh, all of which was brought into the United States by, we'll get on to the order at Skull and Bones. Coming soon to PrisonPlanet.tv, part two of our in-depth interview with Charlotte Thompson Iserby. We will expose the secrets of the order of death, publicly known as Skull and Bones. Mrs. Iserby's information, obtained from her father and grandfather, who were members of Skull and Bones, was the key intel used in the seminal work by Anthony Sutton on Skull and Bones. In part two of this key interview, soon to be released at PrisonPlanet.tv, she will reveal even more information, some of it never before seen or released. Visit InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. When you're on the site, you can also tune in 24 hours a day to my daily radio broadcast. There's also a free iPhone app to listen to the syndicated radio show when and where you want. Mm -hmm.